the F12 Berlinetta. Hi everyone, welcome back to Rich Reviews and welcome to this stunning Ferrari F12 Berlinetta. Now this F12 is in blue Abu Dhabi with a full Kremer interior, but we'll talk you through that a little bit later when we do a walk around of this particular specification. So first of all, I'm gonna go through a brief back history of the two-seater Ferrari V12 GT range. Then we're gonna take a walk around and I'm gonna go through some quirks and features of this particular F12 Berlinetta and the options specified on this particular F12. Then we're gonna take it out on a road for a road test and see how it drives. The F12 is powered by a naturally aspirated 6.3 litre V12. And this V12 pushes out 730 brake horsepower and 509 pound foot of torque. Now the V12 GT model range is the flagship model range for Ferrari. Therefore, it initialized the whole production line, the whole production series of cars for Ferrari. So the first car that was ever developed had a V12 engine in it. And the first V12 powered car was a 125S. And this 125S had 118 brake horsepower and its maximum speed was 130 miles per hour. That's incredible, guys. And that was released in 1947. So in 1947, the first Ferrari that the, the first Ferrari production car that Ferrari developed was the 125S. And that could then at that time, back in 1947, it could had a maximum speed of 130 miles per hour. Pretty impressive, guys. Pretty impressive. We're not going to talk you through all the V12 GT two seater range because obviously it's a substantial production line, but we're going to talk you through some nuances. Now, there was a big gap from the 365 to the 550, and that's really from the 550 onwards is the modern V12 GT series for Ferrari. Um, the model before the 550 was the 365. The last 365 went through the production line in 1973. The first 550 went into production in 1996. Now that's a 23-year hiatus. Nobody really knows why. What's interesting is that Ferrari carried on the 2 plus 2 range during that time. The perception is that they were focusing on racing, um, but nobody really knows. If you do know, please let me know in the comments below. Be very interested to understand why. After the 550 came the 575, a tuned version of the 550. After the 575 came the 599. After the 599 was the 599 GTO, a tuned version of the 599. Then after the 599 GTO came, of course, the F12 Berlinetta. After that came the TDF version of the F12 Berlinetta. Then, as we all know, the 812 and the 812 um, GTS, and of course, the 812 Competizione. Now, Ferrari had two key production lines, the mid-engine supercar and the V12 GT range. During the production line of the 458, yeah, I'm going to talk about the 458. The 458 ran from 2010 to 2015. Now, the F12 Berlinetta ran from 2012 to 2017. So for the key duration of the 458 production line run, the F12 Berlinetta was the flagship V12 GT. During its production run, the F12 was the most powerful Ferrari that they'd ever produced. And Clarkson named the F12 the car of the year 2012. The engine, the V12 6.3 litre F140 engine for the F12 was named the engine of the year 2013. Pretty impressive accolades. Now, depending on who you talk to, this car is a bit of a widow maker. You touch the throttle and suddenly the driver's replaced with somebody like Ken Block and they're broad sliding all over the place. Um, I haven't felt that yet from the little drive I've done to this location, but obviously when we take it out on the road, we'll have a better appreciation of that. And the F12 Berlinetta was the last car that was designed by Pininfarino for Ferrari, not including obviously the 458, which is the last mid-engine supercar that was designed by Pininfarina for Ferrari. Now, you can pick up these cars for around 170 to 220,000 pounds, depending on obviously condition, year um, and specification. 
Um, they were around 240 base, um, base price, so 240,000 got you into the beginning of an F12 and then obviously you optioned it up and obviously that would substantially increase the price depending on the options you added to it. Now, the F12 was 50% improved on aerodynamics over the 599. One of the ways they, they managed that was with the, what's called the aero bridge. Now air comes across the front of the car, it comes down these side ducts, which are actually quite right clear through, comes down through these side ducts, and as you come down the side of the car, you can see this beautiful designed indentated section, so this, this concave section. As you come down this concave section, the air would come down this area, and it's directed up and over the rear haunches to improve downforce. So you get a substantial amount of downforce on the back of the car from the design of this aero bridge, which is very cool. And it also produces, of course, this beautiful um, side design of the car, this beautiful side profile. In addition, the front splitter has what's called active brake cooling. These front flaps stay closed until the brakes get up to a certain temperature whereby these flaps open to increase airflow through to the brakes. Now it increases aer the aerodynamics by being closed. So the on they're only open when the brakes actually need additional cooling. And this improves airflow because this allows the airflow to go around the side of the car unless you need additional brake cooling whereby these flaps open. Now the weight of the F12 is around 1600 kilograms. So it's not too much heavier than the mid-engine supercar, the 458, that was in production in parallel to the F12. The length of this car is only three inches longer than the 458 as well. If you, again, if you, if you speak to people, then the perception is that this is a very long wheelbase car. It isn't really, it's only three inches longer than the 458, which is, again was the mid-engine supercar that was in production line in line with this F12. So the key differences with driving the F12 is the length of the bonnet because it's front engine, well front mid-engined. We'll talk a bit more about that later. So because you're sat pretty much on the rear axle, you've got all this front bonnet section that you have to lead out in junctions, which means you have to turn a little bit earlier. It's got very fast steering anyway, but you have to turn a little bit earlier when you come out in junctions, in junctions because you're sat further back. And of course you have to be a lot more road aware because you've got your in effect pushing the nose out into the, into the traffic before you can properly see. So you've got to be very, very careful. You get an additional sense of awareness with driving these types of cars. Um, it'd be interesting if you actually had a mid-engine supercar and you had an F12 because the nuances between the two would be quite substantial with how you drive them, but that, prob probably that's not very surprising. The successor to the F12 was the 812, which has 789 brake horsepower and 540 pound-foot of torque. Now, there were certain design changes made to the 812 to try and engineer out some of the nuances with the F12. One of the key design changes was the introduction of rear wheel steering, um, which in, in effect um, shortened the wheelbase uh, at below a certain speed and over a certain speed increased and lengthened the wheelbase to make it more stable. One of the other changes was um, they introduced electric steering for the good or bad of it. The F12 is the last flagship at V12, Ferrari V12, to have hydraulic steering. Now we can't feature the F12, the flagship GT for Ferrari, without talking and looking at the engine. Look at that flipping engine! Incredible! Absolutely awesome! Now this is front mid-engine, it's very set back. This is why you have to be quite set back with regards to the seating positions because the engine is right in front of you and you can't be sat on top of the engine for certain safety requirements. So the engine is sat back as low as possible. These are the plenums. So the actual block of the engine is very low in the car and set right back. Now, obviously they have to be able to provide um, access for maintenance. So they can't push it right underneath the car anyway because you'd never be able to get to the car to maintain it, which would push up the, the maintenance costs astronomically if you had to disassemble the car. So that's why the engine is placed in the position it is, obviously for road dynamics, for driving dynamics, and for safety, safety reasons. So you have this long bonnet in front of you when you lead the car out into the road. But again, just look at that. I mean, the atypical red plenums in this beautiful design, Ferrari labeling straight across it in aluminium, just gorgeous. An absolute awesome piece of engineering. So talking through the specification of this F12 Berlinetta, exterior bodywork is colored in Abu Dhabi blue. Looking at the calipers, they're in silver, and of, of course the wheels are too. Uh, moving on to the interior of the car, 
We have a full crema, in, crema coloured interior. Obviously the door cards, the seats are coloured in crema leather, are featured in crema leather. The roof is in crema alcantara. The stitching is in blue, so all the stitching is highlighted in blue. So these are Daytona seats, so you have the blue stitching down the side of the Daytona emblems here in leather, and obviously stitching all the way around in blue, um, as is the center console. The dashboard and the steering wheel is in blue scuro, so blue scuro leather. So that's a, a, a very cool design for this particular car with its Abu Dhabi exterior coloring. Blue carpet, and these are, get this guys, Comp Bob, <laughs> Comp Bob Blau coloured seat belts. So again, I've probably butchered that. Um, if you if you know how to pronounce it, probably let me know in the comments below. But Comp Bob Blau coloured blue seat belt. So Comp Bob Blau means blue, of course. It's the Italian way of saying blue in the options list. So yeah, what a thing of beauty inside here, eh, guys? What an incredible thing of beauty. Opening up the rear, we have quite substantial storage capability here. This section lifts up and you can also move this part forward. So if you need any longer, longer pieces to be able to fit in here, any, any say for example, tripods, we've got all our camera equipment here. If you need those to be fitted um, longitudinally, then you can do so by pushing this piece of um, partition forward. As you look over this flap, you've also got this luggage storage area behind the seats, which is substantial for GT touring. So if you're traveling um, in Europe, say for example, for us, for example, for our European trip that we've just covered off, that would be fantastic to have that storage capability. And of course, you've got the crema lever with blue stitching on the straps as well for the luggage compartment. Now talking about the rear of the car, you have this F1 derived rear fog light which is very cool it's designed very similar to the f1 race cars which is exactly why it was designed in that manner these are all leds so we switch on the rear fog lights and all these are illuminated in red and this is the rear reversing camera so that is actually a camera there that's the rear reversing camera this is very much a design cue of the f12 the way this scoops down and this is to support the aerodynamics to suck the car onto the road. You have additional aerodynamic fins here, which again, with this rear diffuser, helps suck the car down onto the road. So enough talking about the design of the car. The key thing about the F12 is driving it. So let's take it out on the road and see how it drives. the F12 Berlinetta. Well, first impressions. I'm going to deal with the points that a lot of other people have mentioned, so which is the steering, the length of the front of the car, and the brakes. Deal with those issues first of all. First impressions, yes, the steering is fast. Uh, the steering is quite heavy because it's got all that weight up front, uh, but the steering lights up as you, as you push on. And the steering isn't as fast as a supercar, as a Ferrari supercar, certainly not as fast as the 458, for example. How I would describe it is that off centre, there's a, there's a slight bit of latency before it actually turns the wheel. So if you turn the steering wheel off centre, there's a slight bit of latency before it turns the actual um, directional wheels. And that's obviously been engineered in because it's a GT car, they don't want it as fast and as twitchy as a supercar. So if I was going to be comparing the steering to my 458, I'd say actually my 458 is livelier from that respect, which is really what you'd expect because this is a Grand Tourer. It's the Grand Tourer V12, it's, it's not a supercar. With regards to the front length of the car so that when you know when you're coming out when you're driving out into t-junction and such like yes you've got to be careful because you've got quite a bit of length in front of you but the car does shorten around you when you drive it and that surprised me as well because if you look at the length of the front of the car even though it's only three inches longer than my 458 
you still think, wow, you're set, sat pretty much on the rear axle, surely that's got to be a nightmare to place. Take it now, for example, just putting along in seventh gear, taking it nice and easy, and no issues whatsoever, nice and easy to drive. Um, it's not twitchy at all, and the throttle response isn't anywhere near as lively as some people would lead you to believe. Now, got to qualify that. It's a very hot day today. We're in sort of 30 plus degrees outside. The tyres are around 43 degrees at the front, so they're, they're quite warm, especially for the UK. We're running around 60 odd degrees when we're in Europe, when we're pushing on. Um, but here, for Europe, that's quite warm, 40 odd degrees. Just coming up to a junction, and you've got to take notice of the fact that you've got quite a lot of bonnet there, so I'm having to hold back from the junction quite a bit and then push the nose out carefully and then pull away. It's not the same as a, as a supercar where, in effect, you're pretty much over the front axle. The car doesn't have that twitchiness about it that I thought maybe it would have. It's got that, it's got that immediacy about it. It's got that urgency about it when you push on. Um, I'm sure if I pushed hard when I was coming out of corners, the back end would slip away, but you'd expect it to. It's, it's 509 pound foot of torque, you know, it's gonna slip away if you push it quite hard. In effect, what I'm getting down to is, you've got to drive these cars sensibly, you know, if you boot it and you boot it with cold tires, it's gonna flick out and it's gonna bite you. Um, this car definitely feels like it could bite you, but it's not as nervous as, as, um, as other people may lead you to believe. It's quite a comfortable car, and, and that's how you'd expect, you know, for a GT. Um, this, the ride is very comfortable. It's definitely a lot, lot more restrained than my 458, say, for example. So I would say that the, the suspension is a lot softer setup than my 458 is, even without bumpy road mode on. So it's definitely a, um, a lot more biased towards a GT car. Constantly, you can see the front fenders and you can see, or the front wings as I should say, we're based, we're in England now, not America. So constantly you can see the front wings and you can see the buttresses for that aero bridge section on the front wings. Those are always in my peripheral vision. And then that being the case, you automatically place the car. It's not an issue. Um, th those provide directional points for you to place the car on the road. The interior is stunningly beautiful. You've got this Scuro interior. Um, Scuro blue interior, the dashboard and steering wheel, Crema Alcantara in the roof. Um, obviously, you've got the Crema full electric seats, um, and that's a benefit as well because the the full electric seats, even though I prefer race seats, I've got those race seats as people will know in my 458. The benefit of the full electric seats is because I've got a short body, I can elevate the seats up more, which again allows me to see those fender aero buttress sections to be able to place the car better because most of my height is in the length of my legs. So that does uh, provide a benefit definitely in this particular car. One of the other lovely benefits as well in this GT is that when you get in the car and switch ignition on, the steering wheel then locates itself into the pre-settings, into the, the steering wheel locates itself into the pre-configured settings and takes itself up and away so you can get in and out of the car a lot easier. So these are like comfort settings that you have in the GT, which you don't get in the supercar range. That would be great if they had that in the 458 because having bad knees and hips from all the sports I've done, it makes it tricky sometimes to get in and out of the car, whereas this makes it a lot easier to get in and out because the steering wheel lifts out of the way when you turn the ignition off. The air conditioning is very good inside the car too. One of the artifacts I've noticed though on the air conditioning bezels, these circular bezels, which look really cool, is that you do tend to get a bit of condensation around the, I think they are metal, around these metal pivots. Um, that you use for the air conditioning. And whether that's by design or whether that's whether that's by design or whether that's a quirk of this car, I don't know. Of how it's set 
turps, certain dynamics are uh, well, very similar to the 458, although obviously they're very different engines and very different types of cars, with one being a V12 GT and one being a V8, for, um, and one being a V8 mid-engine supercar. The ergonomics of the controls, they all come to hand quite easily, um, no problems. The climate control, well, pretty much that's the same as the 458, so it has the same nuances and peculiarities as the 458 climate control, in effect, most of the time, it has a mind of its own. And also, same as the 458, you can't option, thank you, you can't option any different materials for the climate control surroundings, so you can't, or you can't request it to be in carbon fibre, it's just in this black, tacky plastic. It is what it is. They obviously decided in their infinite wisdom that they weren't going to allow you to um, to have different options for those for the surrounds of the climate control. As you'd expect when you push the loud pedal it shifts. It's not twitchy shifting. Again, qualifying that by we're in 30 plus degrees outside here, it's a hot day. The temperature of the tyres is 43 degrees on the front. With for overtaking. No problems whatsoever. And I'm using about a third throttle there. Not even getting close to the floor mat. Anyway, I'll shut up for a few seconds. Just let you enjoy the sound of this beautiful, gorgeous V12. driving something like a 458 or an FA or a 488 for example then you'd, you'd move the steering wheel a slight amount and it would correct it but it doesn't in this car because you've got that latency so you have to move it a little bit more to correct it uh, but you get used to that it's, it's, it's not a real problem it's by design and that's because it's a GT car when you're doing long miles you don't want a very nervous steering on the car you want something that's going to be a bit more relaxing that you know if you're on a motorway you don't want to have to you know uh, if you if you turn to adjust you, yourself in your seat say for example you don't want to be thinking that you're going to be driving into the, into the um, slow lane or in, you don't want to be thinking you're going to be driving into the left lane or into the right hand lane it's not such a good situation to be in so getting purely on the how this car makes me feel and and, and the, the feeling of this car to drive as I've intimated already it's a joy to drive not as twitchy nowhere near as twitchy as I thought it would be on turn-ins it's quite sharp but not as aggressive as a supercar the steering is direct but not as aggressive as a supercar so for anybody coming out of a normal saloon car yes it's going to seem quite nervous it's going to seem um, quite fast on the steering wheel or very fast potentially on the steering wheel depending on the car you're coming in out from into this but it's fine. I'm, I'm, you know, no problems whatsoever. Nowhere near as nervous as I thought it would be. With regards to the brakes, the brakes are a lot better than the 458. The brakes are fantastic. Um, they haven't got a nervousness to them at all. I find them quite progressive, so no issues there.
Oh. I'm sure this is drinking the fuel. I can see the gauge going down. Obviously, we're going to drop some fuel in for the owner. While we're coming up to this junction, I just want to say a massive thank you to the owner. I'm obviously not going to name him, but massive, massive thanks to the owner for lending us this stunningly beautiful F12 Berlin. It's a very, very kind of him, and we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. So we're going to close out the video now with some likes and dislikes. So first of all, the likes. What's not to like about the look of that? I mean, I absolutely love the look of this car. The, the F12 is a beautiful, stylish looking car. The last Pininfarino designed V12 GT for Ferrari, and it's just stunning. I love the performance. I love the linearity of the naturally aspirated V12. Absolutely love, adore the sound of the V12. It just sounds absolutely incredible. I love the turning of the car. It feels very much like a GT. I love the fact that they've tuned down the steering a bit. So you've got a little bit of latency from the central movement. So you've got a little bit of play there. So it's not as edgy as cars like the 458, 488, F8, the, in effect, the mid-engine supercars. Fantastic. I like the brakes. The brakes are very linear. Um, they seem better than the 458 as well. So um, very much very much like that with regards to the interior i love the layout of the controls they're very similar especially the steering wheel controls to the 458 so um, what's not to like i already know those controls of manatino the indicators the bumpy road mode etc and the starter button can't miss the starter button on the ferrari the length of the car isn't such a problem um, with the fact that you've got these in your peripheral vision these side buttresses on the fenders and your in your in the wings in your peripheral vision so you can place the car actually quite easily so it's, it's not so hard to place the steering is fast enough and turns in well so the car has good dynamics very good road holding as well considering it's 45 percent weighted at the front 50 sorry 44 percent weighted at the front and 56 placed at the back with regards to weight separation so it seems to be a good weight balance of course you've got a lot of mass of the of the engine that you've got to be careful of hence why they've slowed the steering down so that you haven't got that mass yanking you around corners where it could cause problems now with regards to dislikes yes you can't get away from it it feels long because of the length of the front of the car. You're sat pretty much on the rear axle. That's not the best. It's not optimal, but it is what it is. You've got no choice. You've got a whacking great V6.3 litre V12 there. So what do you expect? Um, as dislikes go, it's, it's part of the design. So you can't, you can't avoid it. The steering. I prefer the 458 steering. We did all the Euro trips, so over 3,000 miles in the 458. And the steering, I prefer that, sort of, if you like, more edginess because when you're driving this, when you're driving the F12, you can get to a position where um, it's maybe has been pulled a little bit to the left or to the right by camber. And you go to adjust it with a steering wheel. And of course, I guess it's because I'm used to the 458. I adjust it a little bit and it doesn't adjust it. So you've got to adjust it a bit more. So it just means you've got to move the steering a bit more. Um, and I started to get used to that anyway. So um, that's not such a major thing. But to be honest, guys, I'm struggling to find any dislikes because there ain't that many. <laughs> I pretty much love the car, you know. So overall, thumbs up, guys. Absolutely love it, especially in the specification. Silver wheels over Abu Dhabi blue paintwork with crema interior and the combo bob blow <laughs> probably murdered that seat belts so the blue of the seat belts over the crema the the crema alcantara head headlining with the um with the abu dhabi blue exterior fantastic great specification say i wouldn't have crema on the interior if i was making the choice i'd have black or cuyo because of being tarnished with jeans hence why we're wearing all this light attire today Beautiful car. Again, thank you very much to the owner. Really, really appreciated. Thank you very much to the owner for lending us this beautiful, stunning car. Very, very much appreciated. If you've enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, give it a like. Very important for the channel. If you're not subscribed, please think about subscribing. It's free to do so. It doesn't cost you anything and you can unsubscribe at any time you want. Thanks a lot for watching, guys, and we'll catch you in the next video.